So uh, welcome everyone. Can you hear me okay, Julia? I can, and I was just going to say, I'm now going to hand the session over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome everyone to the Unicorn Challenge. Uh, what a great opportunity for us to hear from startups, pitch their ideas in front of a live, friendly, and in payments, an incredibly informed audience. The Unicorn Challenge also provides a platform to form meaningful connections with the industry experts and influencers while honouring their sales pitches. In 2019, the Canadian financial sector as a whole Women made up only 21% of executive offices. It's imperative we change that. And gender diversity in both FinTech and in finance is critically important for the future. So please support our challenges as they present and provide feedback by voting in the audience choice winner. I know we've got great judges who we'll talk about in a moment, uh, but really the feedback from the audience is clearly part of what this team and the presentations want to see. The prize for this, for our winners, obviously uh, they get a 60 minutes audience with the sponsors executives and in many cases longer than that because we love what they're doing and the purpose of providing objective feedback on the winners concepts. And secondly, $5,000 worth of legal fees from Dentons. Our prize donors are incredible. CIBC, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce that I work for, American Express, the BMO, Interact, JP Morgan, MasterCard, National Bank, RBC, Scotiabank, TD, Visa, Visa, and Dentons. And why so many sponsors is because we all believe in innovation in Canada. Uh, I now will hand over to the judges to introduce themselves and hopefully they will come on screen in one moment. Um, the judges, Sue Britton, Stephanie Chu, Kemi Petro, and Mahina Hoda from EQ Bank. Uh, over to you, uh, Sue. Hi, good morning. I should say almost good afternoon. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Sue. Okay, wonderful. Um, hi, I'm uh, Sue Britton, uh, the CEO and founder of FinTech Growth Syndicate. We're a, um, an innovation advisory firm and uh, really excited to, to see the, uh, the companies present today. Hi everybody, Steph Chu. Uh, I'm a partner at a fund called Portage. We're an early stage fintech specific investor that uh, is invests globally as well in North America and Western Europe, particularly. Um, we were typically investing at seed, series A and series B, and I'm super excited to see the pitches today as well. I guess I'll go next. My name is Tammy Petro. Um, I am our global lead at JP Morgan for Wholesale Payments Innovation, where I'm responsible for developing partnerships with fintech companies that deliver value for our clients and our business at scale. As a former entrepreneur, I'm looking forward to hearing what you're working on and how we might amplify your efforts. It's an honor to be able to share in your story and hear it at this critical time for innovation and entrepreneurship globally. Hi everybody, I'm Mahesha Potter. I lead EQ Bank, which is a digital only retail bank here in Canada. Um, and I'm also the SVP of strategy and marketing for Equitable Bank. I'd say we have a deep interest in payments innovation across the bank. Uh, we do some early stage investments uh, from a strategic perspective and there are also very big proponents of collaboration and partnership on payments innovation on our EQ Bank platform. So really looking forward to what you have to share today. Well, and thank you uh, to our esteemed judges. Now I have the uh, ability to introduce each competitor as they come on screen. Uh, and if I'd ask my judges to uh, come off the screen and we'll ask our competitors to join the screen for a moment. Thank you. And we're just waiting on our competitors to join. Rebecca has joined, uh, and we're just waiting on the others. Hi, Rebecca, and good morning. I'm looking forward to your pitch. Good morning. Thanks, John. And Rim Chikina is joining as well. We're just waiting for the others to join in person. Uh, let me quickly introduce them. Uh, Rebecca is the co-founder and CEO of DealMaker. Uh, Karen Monahan is the co-founder and CEO, CEO of Boss Insights. Uh, Jennifer Arnold, uh, co-founder and CEO of Minerva AI, and Rim Chikana is the co-founder and CEO of Walla. 
it's four amazing pitches. Um, I think Jen's still having uh, some difficulty in joining, but we're going to continue on um, to put out the rules for everyone who's listening in. Uh, so you can do your choice online for the uh, for both the judges uh, criteria and their vote, plus the People's Choice Award. Each competitor has five minutes to present their pitch. The judges will have five minutes to ask questions and it will be I've heard some of the questions. They're uh, looking at all of these uh, very closely, and they'll be they'll be judged across five criteria: uniqueness and creativity of the solution, business models and potential for success, potential impact to market and users, practicality and interoperability, strength and diversity of the startup team. So, with that, uh, I would ask uh, the various participants. Uh, who have now, and we will start with a presentation uh, from Rebecca Kasiba, CEO of Dealmaker. Rebecca, for those that don't know, uh, is the co-founder and CEO, um, founded in 2018. She practiced law on Bay Street for over 10 years, founded the startup practice group at the law, at the law firm, and was co-chair of the Toronto Venture Technology and Emerging Growth Company groups. Also, one of the top 40 under 40 and recognizes one of North America's most innovative lawyers by the Financial Times. I'd ask Rebecca to join the stage and I look forward to your presentation, Rebecca. Uh, good luck and enjoy the time. Great, thanks, John. Thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for having me. So Dealmaker is a company uh, that I co-founded. I practiced law on Bay Street uh, for over 10 years and my co-founder, Matt, uh, practiced on Wall Street. And one of the issues that we saw on both sides of the border was when helping clients complete capital raising. It was an extremely inefficient process. It made everyone very frustrated. They didn't, there was a lot of complex paperwork to be filled out to comply with securities regulations. And clients didn't have good visibility into the payment tracking, which investors had sent funds. They would come in $15 short on a wire transfer. And, uh, and there's a lot of work that goes in at $600 an hour to trying to reconcile all of these funding and paperwork and match them to investors. And so what we did when we were taking a look at the business opportunity was say, we think there's really an opportunity here to re-engineer this entire capital raising process and make it better and more scalable for entrepreneurs. And we can do that by applying technology. As Candy mentioned earlier, it's a really important time for entrepreneurs, not just in Canada, but all over the world to be able to access capital and fund their ventures in a streamlined and more easier way and so this has been a really critical year and pivotal time for dealmaker so when we looked at converting the capital markets and when i say capital markets we're talking about public and private companies public companies who aren't doing a prospectus offering can still raise money using private placement exemptions um, and they do hundreds upon hundreds of times a year so we're looking at the capital markets industry and a lot of the technology there hasn't changed. A lot of the way things are done are still being done the same way they were done in the 70s. And so we said, how do we attack this industry and make sure make it change the behavior, which is not an easy thing to do? Well, we're gonna re-engineer the process and make it over 70% more efficient for all the parties involved. And then we're gonna advance the entire industry forward when you layer technology on what was traditionally a paper-based process, you're going to advance that industry with analytics and we're going to make it easier for entrepreneurs everywhere to raise capital and so how do we convert those people we take a lot of the interesting things we see in technology companies whether it's what amazon's doing with the way you can check out on payments or whether it's what uber is doing with its user experience and we're going to bring those things to the capital markets and this has helped us achieve an incredibly high net promoter score so that people continue to come back and continue to want to convert their behavior to doing things a new way. So to reiterate, we basically developed a software that does best in class closing execution. People can sign complex legal documents now at the click of a button, apply their signature electronically, as well as transfer their funding through ETAC, credit cards, ACH, all kinds of much more convenient paper methods than the traditional Canadian way of wire transfer. Um, we also then leverage on seamless marketing integrations. A lot of this stuff we're seeing in the US is a lot more advanced 
pioneering search engine optimization, we're bringing that to Canada and allowing people to market capital raises in completely new, innovative online ways. And then third, what do we give them at the end of the day is analytics on what's happening in the industry, what their investors are doing, what actions their investors have taken on the system, where investors are geographically based, which gives them power to conduct a better capital raise more swiftly. In terms of the business, uh, we, we constructed it to have a natural network effect, and that was given to us by simply the way the Canadian capital markets operate. You have, always have a lot of people bringing in capital from Europe or the US. So this has, although we've only been um, in operation for two years, this has naturally drawn us into the US market very quickly. Over 65% of our investor portals are already US based. And uh, again, as part of the business model, how do you convert people in an industry to, to get into something that they routinely are doing in a paper-based way? We gave them a flex flexible pricing model that allows them to bill the fees as part of the deal fees, which is really attractive to them. So we have a package for a smaller standard raise, a package for larger retail raise where people are bringing in thousands of investors and then an enterprise pricing package for people who are in the business of raising capital and are integrating dealmaker part of their service offering to their client base. In the last two years, we've uh, closed a couple of hundred thousand dollars of capital in a number of different currencies. We have multiple uh, currency and pricing options, which are really um, helpful for Canadian companies, as I said, who are raising capital from investors all over the world. Um, we close between 20 and 25 new transactions every month. So we have about 75 live deals on the system at any given time. And those are raising capital from investors all over the world. Thank you, uh, Rebecca, and uh, a great presentation. Uh, any final words while I ask the uh, judges to rejoin to ask some uh, questions? Um, from, from me, no, uh, happy to hear from the judges. I'll just flip through. We have uh, a very um, strong backing from a strong board of advisors who are deep in the industry. And um, we've used best in class cloud-based technology to easily leverage and integrate with other solutions that exist in the industry. Excellent. Um, so so maybe I'll start the questions while Sue, Mahima and I What's been the biggest challenge in getting acceptance of your fintech since 2018? Um, I think I think the biggest challenge I would say is just converting people's behavior from an from a paper based process to an online process. There's real power and value, but um, humans are inherently repetitive and want to stick to the way they know to do things. Once we get them on the system, we have a very high retention rate. Um, so so that would be I would say the biggest challenge. Okay, I'll pass over to Sue for the first question. Hi there. Um, I apologize. I had uh, I got I had booted off hop in and and missed half of your presentation. So oh, no. I'm but no problem. That's uh, I'll catch up. Um, and if I missed it, um, can you give me a sense of sort of how you've how far you've come in terms of um, you know revenue and profitability? Yeah, for sure. I actually hadn't hit that, so that's a good question. Um, in our first year, uh, we did 600,000 in revenue, and then this year, despite COVID, we're on track to two and a half or three X that. Okay, can you stop sharing your screen just for one moment, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, the next question will come from uh, Tammy. And Rebecca, when you think about what's coming for you, what are some of your operational targets that you'd like to hit in the coming year? Uh, we see this as a really a platform monopoly opportunity to really um, convert the way private placements are done from paper and onto an online hub where we've got investment bankers, lawyers, um, companies, investors all logging in. So. Um, in terms of operational, I think it, it's being able to grow the fa company as fast as possible um, so that we can retain our, our market dominant position that we currently have and continue to scale in the U.S. and then abroad. Sorry, I didn't actually hear John, but I'm going to assume that I can go next. Um, 
Rebecca, can you talk a bit about how you're acquiring your customers? Like, where are you finding them? And then if there's time, how does your cost of customer acquisition relate to the lifetime value of an average customer? Uh, 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 yeah, the customer, the acquisition is largely referral based. There's a high percentage, about 35 percent of repeat customers. Um, the customer acquisition cost, we were constantly striving to bring it down and um, depending on the three channels, uh, focusing on different uh, pieces of the technology that continue to streamline for each of those. Um, I, I can't give you the exact metrics I at this point though. And, and Steph, the final question from you. Can you talk a little bit about what is your moat versus others in market and how you think a little and how you think about building that for the long term? Yeah, so um, the integrated technology, I call it like TurboTax for securities law. So we have the ability to set up any offering um, across North America, just regardless of the exemption and put question, investors an easy question and answer flow. So um, that really is a significant amount of combining technology with legal intellect that is not possible and you don't you can't see it in another solution they just don't have um, that marriage of legal and technology okay thank thank you rebecca great presentation i wish we had more time because i uh certainly uh know where you're going and eliminating paper is one of the things i really want to do both in uh securities uh mortgages payments checks uh very much for your time and now I'd ask the judge to leave and I'd invite Karen to join uh, as the judges uh, drop off. Thank you again for your presentation okay. and have a great Thanks. day. You too. And I see Karen has joined and Mahima if you could also uh, drop. Hi Karen and uh, welcome uh, the uh, Unicorn Challenge. Uh, for those that don't know uh, Karen Mahan is the CEO and co-founder of Boss Insights. Uh, over to you, Karen, uh, as you go forward. Thank you Thank very you. much, John. So great to be here. So I'm going to do the same thing as everybody else and ask if you can all see my screen before I get going. So wonderful to be here. Thank you for this excellent platform for myself and the other female uh, incredible co-founders. I am a former RBC commercial banker and co-founder of Boss Insights, and we've uncovered a massive opportunity in business lending and business banking in general. The challenge that we see, particularly me being a former banker myself, is that there's a lot of downside risk, but limited upside potential. And that's never been more true than it is now in 2020, where things are slow and costly, while the need by businesses have never been higher, the interest rates are lowering, so the profit is actually being squeezed, and with the oncoming onset of a potential recession, the risk is even higher. And that's evidenced by the $5 trillion need gap globally in business lending and the fact that it's growing at such a staggering rate. But to bring it home and how I felt it in my experience is that every day in the US, 8,000 businesses walk into banks, credit unions, alternative lenders, ask for money, get declined, and the same groups that spend so much time, energy, and money on lead generation can't help them. They don't have the data to do so. And when I was pushing loans through credit, there wasn't enough chocolate in the world to give to the credit team to apologize for my tenacity to try and support these businesses because they need us. What we've done is we've created a platform with the global leading number of connections to cloud-based business software. And what we're doing is we're applying a tech lens to business banking, which is currently product focus. It should be. These products are very complex and it's in a regulated environment. But from a user perspective, there's no delight in being approached to get qualified and then decisioned and onboarded and reported um, and go through monitoring, which is the same thing as decisioning and then cross-selling as an afterthought. What we have is access to accounting and marketing and sales information and so on and so forth, which can be gathered on demand so that a banker only asks the business for two to three minutes of their time and the rest of the relationship is focused on serving them. If you seize the data, you capture the business lending market. Please don't take Boss Insights' word for it. Square, 
uh, lent over $800 million in a few months this year by adopting this type of technology, and 60% of that was new business. So here's a little snapshot in the time that we have of some of the connectors that we have in one category. And here on the other side of the screen are all the categories that we support. We have a very broad lens to this because of the tech focused. We wanted to provide insights across the business so that we could serve small and medium business and commercial businesses all at once and any form of lending that is required for businesses to get. The benefit is I will again take a, a saber sword to paper. It's not just paper, physical paper. It's also electronic PDFs. If you're asking for them, they have to be processed and analyzed and it's what's slowing everything down. But with access to a platform like this with on-demand data, you then have access to the insights and the decisionable and actionable insights in order to serve those business customers in the way they deserve. We're really grateful to the people who are working with us in market. We're actually in market with a top five bank in Canada, and we're working with some community banks and regional banks in the United States, as well as private lenders. We're part of Oracle's partner network, and not only that, but out of the over 100 of fintechs that they're working with, they chose three to take to market this year, and we're so proud to be one of them. This quote here really says it all. In the middle of COVID funding, there was a community bank in the US that thanked us for helping them streamline, which what everybody can agree was an onslaught of need by market. And we also would like to say thanks to the media publications who have uh, allowed us to put out our thought leadership. We have doubled our revenue from last year and we're on track to get to seven figures of annual recurring revenue in the next year. We were thankful to BDC for securing a debt financing line this year to us. We approach markets in direct sales, through thought leadership and through our channel partners like Oracle. And none of this would be possible without our, our management team and advisors. Luke Moynihan came from Amazon where he was scaling technology and saw the need for business insights. And sure enough, Amazon is now in lending. He created the scalable global leading number of platform connectors. And then we added in uh, Simon Brightman who ran data and strategy at TransUnion. Myself, I was on the front lines as a commercial banker experiencing the problem every day. And we're thankful to our advisors who come from heads of banks and other fintechs that have achieved uh, successful status to make sure that they're there to give us guidance. Well, we're okay, and, and oh. Karen, I need to stop sure. you there. Uh, we're going to um, end up an incredible presentation in an area that, you know, my background is commercial lending. Um, <laughs> tell me, as I invite the judges back to ask me, tell me what it's been like to change and what you did personally to move from being a commercial lender across into fintech. Uh, what was that like? And tell me your experience. Oh, of course. I I think in some ways I was always going to be an entrepreneur. It's third generation, but I never really saw it that way because it wasn't in finance. I was out of school and I saw RBC as a leading financial institution doing incredible things. So excited to become a relationship manager tasked to bring in 10% revenue growth every year. But 85% of my time was basically on paper pushing and acting as a human calculator. And it just wasn't inspiring. So I kept raising my hand to ask, can we do this better? What would Excellent. you think? Yeah. That's great. Um, I'm going to hand over to the judges instead of listening to me. Uh, the first question will come from Steph. Maybe just clarify where your solution kind of starts and where it ends, because you do I think you do now a lot of different things on that value chain from like data collection all the way to the actual front end for the customer itself. So maybe, look, I, I think just understanding what all the different pieces are would be helpful. Yeah, thank you so much, Steph, for that question because it, it really helps bring it home. We're, we're a data provider. And this year, what we're seeing in banks for the first time since digitization is now the hot topic is that data is a mandate. Having access to real-time information on their customer so they can serve that customer is actually a mandate within the banks that we're dealing with. So we have what, what I, because I talked too long, what I didn't have a chance to say is that there's a no-code adoption. This can be adopted in one day by banks and they can plug in that information wherever they see fit. But what we're offering is insight into their customers in a way that they've never had access to before. Does that so help? It's a plug that allows you to, so if you have a ready, like an underwriting algorithm, your data, it's basically data collection that allows you to plug into an existing digital onboarding or digital underwriting flow. Okay. Yes. 
And it's a platform. We do have algorithms as well. So we have the no-code adoption, and then we have the enterprise level for people who want us to actually look at even machine learning models for credit. Excellent, Karen. Thank you. We'll move to Temi for the next question. Thanks for that. Karen, I and your model today, how you're thinking about that moving forward. There's certainly a lot of different areas you could seek to monetize that information. And I'd love to understand how you're thinking about that. It's, these are amazing questions. <laughs> Can we have 20 minutes? Um, so we currently focus on a- Oh, <laughs> keep going, Karen. <laughs> Um, we currently focus on charging either per borrower or as a percent of the loan, depending on the lender we're working with. The idea being that we're a tech provider. We're never going to be a lender. We're looking to increase the ability of the bank to earn revenue, and we seek to take a very small percentage of that as a result. Thank you, uh, Karen. The next uh, question will come from Mahima. Hi, Karen. Uh, I'm just wondering, with the integrations that you have already let's say on the accounting side how much of the small business market in Canada is covered 80% it's uh, we took we we took the 80 20 rule approach mm -hmm. and actually we are expanding looking at other partners who have coded for even 18 accounting software providers to enable them to be on our platform so it would be a hundred percent coverage globally well wow. Um, and the final question from uh, Sue. Hi, Karen. Nice to see you. Um, <laughs> uh, we should definitely get together because we work with a number of um, companies on uh, their small business lending strategies. And I think uh, what you're doing is really cool. I'm curious about um, what would you say are the, you know, the, the what's, what's the top kind of data use case that is most of most interest to banks and community banks and credit unions and so on. I will surprise no one by saying that it's accounting and it's because financial statements are relevant no matter what you're doing. But that will tell you where a business has been and what we're also looking to provide is where a business is going. So payments, that's third party verified information. And then AI and machine learning tells you exactly where the business will go. So that's a, so we, we are out of time, Karen. I wish I had 20 minutes. I've got lots of questions on your platform and I look forward to chatting with you uh, in the future. Great presentation and thank you to the judges. And I'd ask Jennifer now, uh, uh, I, I would really like uh, Jennifer to now join and thank you everyone. Uh, and Tammy has now left. So I'm just waiting for Jennifer to join. Uh, we've seen two incredible uh, presentations so far. Hi, Jen. Uh, welcome uh, to the Unicorn Challenge. If you could bring your presentation up and just uh, make sure that it's shared with the audience. Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's what I wanted to do. So yeah. while uh, Jen is setting up here, Jen is the CEO and co-founder of Minerva AI, founded in 2018. Uh, Jennifer's a longtime AML nerd. I don't think anyone's a nerd who deals with AML, by the way, because it's incredibly uh, hard to do and translating regulations into policy practices mm -hmm. and process. Uh, most recently, the VP of Governance at, and Controls at Wells Fargo and a Senior Director of AML uh, with my own bank. Uh, Jennifer, uh, if you could share your presentation without people seeing it because it's fairly small on the screen anyway. They want to hear from you regardless, Jen. So All let's right. hear from you. Oh. Super confident. It doesn't matter. We don't have the presentation. We'll make All sure right. the judges get to see it and we'll get it done. Uh, and over to you, Jen, starting now for your five minutes. All right, here we go. So uh, I'm nicely caffeinated today, so I will try to speak at a regular pace instead of sounding like a crazy chipmunk. Uh, so my background, my area of expertise, as mentioned, is anti-money laundering and financial crime. The biggest problem in my industry, and certainly what I've been stumbling with in my career for years, is financial crimes programs cost banks a whole hell of a lot of money and they're not particularly effective, and they're really, really not very efficient. And I think we've seen a lot of that in the news in the last three days with the FinCEN leaks and changes to the regs um, in the US coming out and for us next June and so on and so forth. So we know that this is a pretty hot topic. It's really expensive, it's really inefficient. And why? The backbone of those, invest of those programs are investigators, and their tools of the trade haven't changed in about 20 years. 
So when our industry is under pressure, uh, and we have cases piling up and regulatory change, our go-to move is to hire more bodies, which is not sustainable. We can't have infinite hiring uh, in financial institutions into compliance teams. It, it actually, it's not sustainable and it doesn't make any sense for us. So I'll give you a real life example. Um, a few years ago, I was heading up um, an AML team at one of our big banks and we had a massive backlog that we were sitting on, which is not a great thing. Uh, executives don't like it, regulators don't like it. So I was given $24 million to hire more investigators. So I spent that $24 million in about mm, six months and brought on a heap of investigators and nothing changed. Productivity didn't improve. It was still half a case a day. Uh, the quality of investigations actually decreased because we had so many newbies um, and we didn't make a dent in the backlog. We were right back to square one, except we were now $24 million down. So our revenue generating business partners really, really didn't love us more than usual. So instead of doing that and using these crazy processes that investigators use today, which are manual and menial, for example, you could spend up to a day searching the internet for information on a client, looking for adverse media or beneficial ownership information or social media and social network information. They spend their day hunting and pecking for this information and then using cut and paste to compile it into a case document. And then they're supposed to make a decision about the client, good guy, bad guy, keep them, get rid of them, so on and so forth. They're supposed to be able to make a fact-based, um, evidence-based decision on the client. It's really hard to do when you spend most of your time surfing the internet looking for information. So we created Minerva. Minerva AI is a, a tool, a platform for investigators to one, increase productivity and to increase the quality of investigations. So, one, we catch the bad guys, yay. And two, we make the regulators love us, yay. Uh, in theory, I'm not sure regulators can love, but there we have it. Um, so that is what we went after. What Minerva does is uses um, AI and automation to make the investigators uh, faster and, and really and smarter. So they enter a single search on their subject, whether it's a person or an entity. And Minerva goes out and pulls back billions of data points about that particular search subject. What some of the AI is doing is what we call consensus tech, which is weeding through all the people or entities of a similar or same name to find the one that I'm looking for. Once identified, all of that information that is relevant in the context of financial crime about that client is sucked back into Minerva and organized into a really um, well-structured report that provides sentiment and risk and context analysis on the information that we've collected and then does all the busy work of cut and paste and screen grabs and so on and so forth, compiles it into a document that the investigator reads, makes their decision and moves on to the next. That document, which is now their case file, also satisfies all of their regulatory obligations. So in a nutshell, that's what we have built. Um, we have two POC clients. We are pre-revenue, early stage startup. That's um, really where we're at. But even though it's very early days for us, um, I think the need and market is so acute that we have these two clients and we are fielding um, some really interesting clients via LinkedIn. We're getting a lot of inbound via LinkedIn. So that's where we are. Can you hear me okay, Jen? Great presentation and thank you for uh, just continuing on even without the uh, presentation in front of you. AML is such a, a critical area. What have you found in the, as you talk about POC clients since very early from you, you didn't talk a lot about team. Could you just tell us a little bit about your team and uh, how you brought it together and the POC yeah. as we go forward? Thank you. Sure. So we are a team of three founders. Um, two of us are business. So the former Camlo for Wells Fargo Canada also used to be in a senior position at CIBC and myself are the business leads. So we are the domain expertise and we are those hardcore AML nerds. I love this. I love this world. This is the only problem I've ever come across that I've wanted to spend my life solving. Um, it's cover so, for so many heinous crimes. Our CTO was introduced to us by a friend at McMaster University who said, I have one genius to share with you. Don't break him. And uh, they gave us Damien, who is, um, I, I don't even know how to describe him. He is a, he is a, our developer. He is a genius. Hey, 
It's, thanks, you, Jen, and uh, I love the humour that you put with it. Uh, and it's always hard to uh, deal with geniuses uh, like that. Tell me the first question from you. I love how you were just um, able to make such a an obtuse topic so relatable through your examples. One of the questions I had is, how are you thinking about selling this into other banks? Um, particularly because AML and privacy are such huge concerns. So um, we've done a, a couple of things. So my immediate network, as is Victor's, is obviously legacy banks in Canada. That's where we've worked. Those are the folks we know. And so that is where we are starting. Our beachhead really is fintechs and neos because they don't really know it yet, but they're the ones who are most in need of help and most likely to get fined in a really short period of time. Um, so it's all founder-led sales uh, so far. What we have also found is um, we have channel partners getting into the mix and reaching out to us. So credit bureaus looking to uh, use the service as well as share the service with their client base. I feel like I missed part of your question. Well, thank you, uh, Jen. The no, next it's question. Okay. Okay. No, it's okay. Like given the time we have, Jen, I'm going to have to uh, okay. go to my judges, Mahima. Uh, is next. I can tell you're excited, Jen, about this topic, and I've never heard anyone <laughs> as excited on AML as you. <laughs> I, Mahima? I totally echo your findings. I mean, it's definitely the same situation uh, for us at Equitable. Um, my question is more around how do you prove out the efficacy of your AI models? Like, are you doing test data or like splitting the? Sorry, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> So um, a couple of things. One, we spent a lot of time building up the proprietary data sets that we would need to do the kind of modeling that we wanted to do. Um, and we have, we've taken a number of approaches uh, for those particular models. One is we have, early on, it started with a lot of human in the loop. Um, and then we slowly kind of removed our, ourselves for that. And then what we've been doing with clients and potential clients are bake-off scenarios where we take one of your use cases that you've struggled with and we do it with you live in a demo and show you what Minerva provides. So that's really borne out the time efficiency as well as the accuracy and the quality of the results for us. And we've got time for one final question. Uh, Steph or Sue, a final question. Yeah, I'm happy to go. I've looked at a few different solutions like this in the past. And one of the places as an investor I've struggled with a little bit is the, the overall TAM of the market, which I think is, which, which I'd love for you to comment on a little bit, because I think one of the issues with something like this is it's often considered, compliance is often considered a cost center, unless you can really make the use case that you're going to save money on regulatory fines. So I'm curious how you're dealing with that challenge. So there's a, there's a couple of things there. One, it's um, avoidance of fines for sure, but also cost containment around your FIU and your compliance team. You don't need to hire forever to get through your next remediation or backlog or whatever. You'll be able to um, kind of pick up the pace with the folks that you have. The TAM is insane, right? Like if you look at it globally, uh, I think Thomson Reuters estimated it at like $180 billion. But if we look at our folks here in North America where we're starting, so if I look at financial services, insurance, um, like in fintechs, that that crowd uh, in the U.S. and Canada, that's about a ten billion dollar market today, just on the investigation piece that I'm addressing with Minerva, and then globally, obviously, that's uh, significantly larger. And then if you roll in industries like law enforcement, casinos and gaming, third party risk management, again, in North America alone, I think that number goes up to twenty billion. Well, thanks, Jen, for your answer, and clearly. AML is a topic that I've never been as excited about until now and the solutions there. So uh, thank you for your presentation today. Uh, and I know our time is up. I wish we all had more time. And uh, Sue, you, you will certainly get to go first. So no pressure on you, you. Rim. Uh, Sue will be the first questioner in the next section. So if Jen, if you could drop from this and, uh, and also ask uh, Tammy to drop. And uh, Rim, uh, I'll introduce you, obviously the co-founder and CEO of Waylo. Uh, looking forward to your presentation and I look forward to uh, uh, the five minutes and then the questioning that can come after. So uh, your time starts now. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Rim Sharkani, co-founder and CEO of Waylo. 
what if your child threw away six hundred and seventy thousand dollars well that's what the average american household leaves on the table during their lifetime because they don't have the knowledge the skills the confidence to manage their money in an efficient manner and that's where wallow comes in and fills the gap the Wallow Mobile app connects to parents and their teens' bank accounts and teaches young people how to become financially responsible. What makes Wallow unique is that we embed financial education into a fun gaming experience using real life money. So teens are guided throughout their financial and learning journey to make the next best actions based on the financial health score in the background. They are incentivized to using coins, rewards, nudges, and social proof. Let's take an example. This is Laura and her two teenagers, Leo and Julie. Laura downloads the Wallow app, registers her children, connects bank accounts, and sets up allowances. As you can see, Laura and her children now have their own version of the Wallow app. The goal here is to empower Laura to teach Julie and Leo about money and to spark the money conversation in the family. The Wallow app has three educational components around saving, spending, and earning. And then learning is gamified overall. Now, Julie can learn to save and start developing healthy habits by creating meaningful saving goals and contributing regularly. She can earn extra money by completing tasks. Her mom assigns paying jobs for her to, to motivate her to work for her money and learn the value of money. As her checking account is connected to Wallow, Julie can monitor her transactions and start building awareness about mindful spending habits. Leo, on his own, loves binging quizzes and earning extra coins. He teases his sister as he tends to always come first in the weekly leaderboard. And he also completes suggested activities to earn extra coins. Uh, Wallow automatically recommends the next best action for him to maximize his progress and financial literacy. And this is generated by our proprietary machine learning algorithm. Julie and Leo rede can redeem their hard-earned coins for rewards in, in, in our built-in store, which is adaptive and built to grow with usage and external offers. There are 95 million Julies and Leo in North America alone, and over 150 million parents such as Laura. If we factor in a very conservative average revenue per user of $25, that's a market worth over $6 billion. In terms of go-to-market right now, we are experimenting with a free public app in the App Store, which is in beta. But our end game is B2B2C, and the reason is that our ambition is to become a global player. And we believe that in order to reach scale and win the market, we need to hack our way into customers' hands by piggybacking onto existing networks. And we're looking to partner with financial institutions and license a white-labeled version of the Wallow app. Our white labeled app is plug and play. We use third party aggregators and have built a solution that needs minimal integration in a cost effective way. We forecast that most of our revenue will come from this licensing model. Our B2C app is monetized through a freemium model and it's also a playground for us to keep on innovating and testing new features. The impact for consumers are pretty straightforward. So for parents, it's peace of mind. They are empowered to give the gift of financial education to the kids, teens get to build money life for skills, and overall we're looking at financially healthier families and society as a whole. And what's in it for financial institutions? Well, they get to reduce their cost of customer acquisition by onboarding their clients, children, they get to increase their net promoter score by offering a delightful family banking experience driven by real life value and consequently increase market share for their youth segment, which is one of the very few growth segments in personal banking now and in the near future. And I really want to emphasize this last point because we tend to underestimate how big this opportunity is. To oversimplify, if you have 1 million clients today and say one out of five has a child, that's 30% more untapped new customers. Time to introduce you to our core team, starting with myself. I personally come from banking and strategy consulting. I have advised senior executives in North America, Australia, Europe, and Africa. And I'm surrounded by an extraordinary team with extensive knowledge and work experience in tech, uh, customer experience, product, marketing, data science, and education. For example, my co-founder part is a senior software engineer who shipped high visibility products at Amazon and LogMeIn. A little bit about Wallow, we started over a year ago. We've received multiple grants and awards and we're currently at, incubated at Desjardins Startup in Residence Program. I wanna take, the, and I wanna take the, the, this time to 
thank the Women in Payment team for this opportunity to be here today. We need more women empowerment initiatives like this. And my ask to the audience is simple. We're looking for financial institution partners. So please reach out to us, to me, if you're able to help. Thank you. Rim, terrific presentation in an area that is is so important. Uh, and I know Australia, where you've been a management consultant, has done a lot of work around this with you know the various banks and applications like uh, uh, Green Street, uh, mm -hmm. Money Monster, uh, Wally, and those types. Um, how do you see this fixing you know the financial literacy? You know where U.S. there was 113 billion worth of interest on credit cards last year, for instance. How do you see this playing a part in that? changing the future of financial literacy? Uh, thanks for the question, John. I, I think the first thing is about changing customer behavior and customer behaviors get changed, get, 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 uh, get learned very early in life. So if you try to change someone's behavior at 40 or at 30 while he's been doing that for the last 10 years, 20 years of his life, it's way harder than to instill those healthy habits earlier and the second point is that it's very important to include nudges and, and things that make it really easy for the, for, for the behavior to change because consumers are irrational, kids are irrational, and if you don't teach them how to, 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 to better deal with those irrational uh, consumption behaviors, then they're not going to just learn it by themselves. Um. Okay, then the first question from you already started. I apologize. I shouldn't have interrupted. Go ahead. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Yes. Um, wow, Rem, what a great presentation. I, every question I was coming up with, you answered. And I have three kids. I definitely, you know, I think there's a real need in the market for what you're doing. So congratulations. Thanks, um, I also think that there's some partner opportunities outside of financial institutions that I'd love to chat with you about. Mm -hmm. um, so one year in, how ready are you to go through, you know, John's sort of partner review process at CIBC or mm -hmm. Tammy's at, at, like what, give me a sense of where you're at in terms of the, sure. the product itself. So the product is, is ready. Basically we have a better version in, in the, the in the stores, we have been testing with over a thousand people with it. Uh, it works well. It's it's ready. The uh, the other thing is that we're already incubated at Desjardins Startup in Residence Program, so we're we're in the process of, of getting started on the first POC. Um, we're we're just like at that stage where we need a first uh, real customer that will take this and int integrate it go through the, the small integration process and then get going into scaling. Awesome, thanks. The next question is from Tammy. And if we were to sign up as a banking partner, what is it you'd like to learn in a potential POC? Sure, so the, the first thing is, is really uh, getting through the whole uh, process of onboarding existing clients onto this and understanding we understand who are our clients in the public but in a specific bank or in a specific credit union we need to be able to understand what are their specific needs and how do they relate to the other products that the credit union or the the bank is offering so i think the learning process is around uh adoption engagement and stickiness among that specific population in a bank Excellent. Um, and Steph, a question from you. Yeah, question around um, competition and differentiation, because I think totally right that there's a big market need here. Um, I've seen a few solutions like this. H how do you guys think about breaking away from the, the pack around competition? So I, I think one, one of the things we've noticed about our competition is the focus has been made a lot in their product development around the banking aspects of their product, getting a prepaid card, getting a debit card, uh, getting the actual like uh, a functioning app that just does transaction. 
Whereas in our case, we've put most of our efforts around engagement and customer experience and actually getting the app between the hands of young teenagers and getting them to, to give us ideas about how to make this engaging and social. So I think the experience is, is, is way, way more advanced as well as our approach. The second thing is our approach to data. So we had a data scientist, a head of data since day one, and if we've been developing models uh, to make sure that our insights are, are relevant to our users and to guide the user throughout their experience instead of just giving them the, the app and letting them use it, you know? And, and the final question, given time, uh, Mahima. Um, I'm just wondering on your sales cycle, like, are you finding that the FIs need you to prove out customer acquisition and downloads on your own before they're willing to do a POC? And if that's the case, how are you going to go about that? Uh, we we didn't have that specific challenge because our our product, our B2C product is, let's say, um, a little bit different than the, 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 the B2B one because it has connections to bank accounts, et cetera. Uh, I think the main challenge we've been, ha we've been having, definitely the sales cycle is long, but uh, it, it's really around building those relationships and, and showing the, not the traction figures, but the actual engagement figures and stickiness figures that results that we're seeing in, in our analytics. Okay, thank you. And uh, we need to stop it there. It's a great presentation and uh, I need an application of how I can stop my kids using my Starbucks app, if uh, you can add that. Uh, so realistically, Thank incredibly you. important. Financial literacy is one of the most important uh, things I've been personally involved in this and building some of these applications out over a period of time. I would ask the audience if they could uh, to click on the right hand side and it says polls. And if everyone could uh, go into the poll and vote, uh, please, as we go through to uh, get to our choice. And then uh, I will invite the judges and all of the participants back uh, to be able to to ask and provide some of the feedback uh, from this wonderful group of presentations. Uh, my mind is obviously looking at all of the different options that I could use this. Uh, we've gone from financial literacy that we just saw to capital markets, to capital raising, to AML, all of these uh, are incredible uh, leadership from women. It's what I spoke about at the start. We're lucky in Canada, we have some of the most amazing unicorns and fintechs that are available. Um, at this time, if I'd, I could ask all the judges to rejoin and our uh, various participants who have presented uh, so the judges can provide uh, some feedback. Uh, and we'll start with the feedback uh, Hi, Jen, welcome back. Uh, as everyone joins, we're just gonna keep going here. So we're gonna ask Sue Britton uh, to start. Uh, and I'm sorry, I missed you out on question number three. I, it wasn't intentional, I can assure you. <laughs> if you'd like to provide some feedback to the, the various participants today. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think, and, I, and I'll have to follow up with Rebecca on uh, DealMaker because I did unfortunately miss a good chunk of that, but um, all very important and relevant solutions to echo what you said, John, uh, that are needed in, in Canada. Um, I think there's, from a, an industry perspective, I think there might be, um, you know, uh, Karen, I think you've got a huge opportunity to help um, small businesses. I'd be curious to understand what your um, uh, thoughts are around the, you know, helping to solve the adjudication issue, um, right? Like in terms of alternative data sources, can any of your sources become things that, you know, um, lenders can use to speed up and, you know, make better informed decisions for those small businesses? Should, should I, I didn't know if it was feedback or if I should answer or? No, we don't need to answer right now because I, 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 the questions will go on all day because we loved your presentations. Yeah. Uh, Mahima, your feedback? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought these were all fantastic uh, presentations and really great ideas, um, both as a potential investor and then definitely as a user on the um, FI aesthetic so see very strong applications for our business. I think my one piece of feedback on the 
Um, FI as a consumer is, and you're probably well aware, but there is so many challenges around the sales cycle and finding the right connections within the banks. Um, so, I mean, I think it's staycation. And as much as you do have your own personal connections within the banking partners, I would leverage those just because I've seen um, quite a few fintechs burn out on those uh, sales cycles, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Mahima. And we'll move across to Steph for her comments on the presentations. Yeah, great presentations. I, I would say one piece of feedback that applies to everybody would be, I might try to, especially because all of your solutions are B2B solutions and most of the, the people in the audience are from your customer base, I think talking a little bit about implementation and how easy or hard it is to actually implement, I think, I think is is important but i know also we have very limited time so top line well done everyone. and uh thank you judges uh for your uh great insights and clearly you know as the moderator i i guess i get some words uh i think cyber is a really important all of you are working on data uh i think uh security and concerns around cyber and data is really critical i i heard the api and everything else so well, I go through the, uh, I do have the results from the judges. Uh, I'm just waiting on the final seconds, uh, uh, the final seconds of the poll. Uh, so just a countdown of 20 seconds. Uh, so I'll give everyone a countdown for the polls from all of the viewers today. Um, and I'll go into the uh, judges award to start with. And I'd really like to say all the presentations were incredibly uh, insightful and I look forward to actually meeting with all of you. Um, but uh, there can only be one winner today and our winner today is uh, Karen Monaghan, uh, the co-founder of Boss Insights in an area that I think is incredible. Uh, and it's incredible because it's in small business lending in a time of uh, crisis where we need to do better in Canada uh, to move forward. I thought the presentations were incredibly insightful but congratulations, Karen, as the winner of the uh, judges award. Any any words? Congratulations. We need, <laughs> does it, we need some cheering. I wish I had a, a thing. So congratulations, Karen. And the winner, I, um, uh, it's incredible. Oh, Go ahead, Karen. <laughs> Go ahead. I just want to thank you all very much. As you can see, I'm in a little bit of shock because I have never won a pitch competition before. I think everyone here is doing an amazing job. I've reached out to all of you so we can collaborate and we can all help each other grow. And the feedback is still on point. I've taken notes. Thank you guys all so much. Thank you, Karen. And uh, once again, congratulations from the judges. A great presentation. And the Audience Choice Award uh, goes to something that personally I'm very passionate about, which is financial literacy. Uh, Rim, congratulations uh, on the Wallow winning the People's Choice Award. I think it's a noble cause that needs to be improved and I look forward to talking with you more and I wish every one of our incredible female leaders of great fintechs every success in Canada as we move forward. I know out of this pitch, uh, I look forward to meeting with you all and continuing on with your journey. There wasn't one I didn't think I could use in some uh, specific order. I, I, I'm going to say the technical challenges and doing this in a virtual way. I know it's always hard to go forward, Rebecca, and my my notes on your presentation, I look forward to introducing you to different people as well, because I know exactly where I would use your, your uh, potential as well. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining today. I'd, I'd, I'd be remiss in not thanking our sponsors, uh, CIBC, American Express, BMO, Interact, JP Morgan, MasterCard, National Bank, RBC, Scotia, TD, and Visa. And for those who presented today who are judges, they all want to meet you in the future. And I'm going to say we're all sponsors because we really believe in uh, entrepreneurship and women in Canada. And I'd also finally like to thank Women in Payments. Uh, Christy and her team doing an amazing thing in building this unicorn mm -hmm. challenge. And every year, I'd like to say we see incredible things from this group. We wish you every success in the future. And I hope you all end up as the next Shopify, Google, uh, Amazon. Uh, and if you can solve AML, Jen, 
I look forward to every discussion on that. I will. So thank you everyone. Have a great day and we'll close the uh, presentation now. Once again, thank you very much to our judges, presenters, and to our sponsors. Without you, this wouldn't happen. And thank you for be, being great Canadian fintechs and startups. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. So uh, what an amazing competition. So many, many congratulations. John, you did a fantastic job in navigating us all through uh, on, on this digital platform. So congratulations. And how could, could it, Julia, how, how, how could it not be like that? It was incredible. What great presentations yeah. we just saw. Uh, it's the favorite part of the Women in Payments Hall event for me every year. Incredible women leading fintechs and leading great solutions. Uh, back to you, Julia, and thank you for the invite again to be part of this. Oh, pleasure. Oh, and by the way, John, I, I, I got a WhatsApp message saying, and actually this is to all of the women who have been presenting and all of the judges, and in fact to every single person who has tuned in to the Unicorn Challenge. <laughs>